So let's talk about some causes of seizures and epilepsy. One thing I'll often say to families at the beginning of all of this is when a child has a first seizure, the question always comes up, why is my child having seizures? Is that we're going to look for the causes for the seizures. We'll talk about history, maybe do some tests like an MRI or EEG. But you never really want to find the cause for a child's seizures. If you have no cause that you can find, we might call that an idiopathic epilepsy, it makes it much more likely the child will outgrow their seizures. When we do start getting into history and doing diagnostic testing, I like to talk about and ask questions about what happened either prenatally or perinatally. What happened, any unusual uh, events that happened uh, when you were pregnant with, with the child or complications that happened um, during the delivery. Something like hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. That's where a child's brain is deprived of oxygen uh, when they were born any sort of uh, inborn errors of metabolism which might show up in the neonatal period. Again, these are unusual conditions where there's other symptoms besides seizures that happen. In the childhood and adolescent period, there's some other causes for seizures, things like infections, encephalitis, meningitis. We might call those a symptomatic epilepsy or if it's many years after uh, encephalitis or meningitis, we have a name for that, like a remote symptomatic uh, epilepsy if you have seizures from an old meningitis or encephalitis. Other things like trauma, uh, car accidents, concussions. Now not uh, in with, with concussions, this is an important point, is that uh, if you fall to the ground, hit your head, and have a seizure, that's a provoked seizure. Uh, wouldn't be part of epilepsy, because if you remember, epilepsy is having two or more unprovoked uh, seizures. So if you hit your head and have a, con a concussion, that's just a provoked seizure. Now, if you have such a severe concussion or head injury that you end up having recurrent seizures, that's a sort of symptomatic uh, epilepsy that could be from trauma, and more common in childhood and adolescence. And then late adolescence and adult, again, traumas uh, can be a uh, cause for, for seizures and then um, some sort of uh, drug toxicity, not acute intoxication, because remember that's a provoked seizure. Alcohol withdrawal can also cause provoked seizures, uh, but some sort of medication that causes permanent neurological damage can cause seizures. If we can't find a symptomatic cause for the seizure, some sort of uh, event or trauma or something wrong with, with the brain that caused this, the seizure, the next thing I'll think about are pediatric epilepsy syndromes. These are syndromes, they're sorts of epilepsy that we know a lot about. So for example, for infants, we'll talk about something like infantile spasms. Infantile spasms is a common cause of epilepsy in children um, when a cause is found. Usually, even in, in infants, um, the most common cause is idiopathic. That means we'll look real hard and not find anything. But if we do find a cause, infantile spasms is one of the infantile uh, epilepsy syndromes. Uh, usual age of onset is 3 to 12 months. Um, this is uh, characterized by recurrent spasms, usually flexion spasms, sometimes described as a Muslim prayer sort of uh, position, tend to come in clusters uh, upon awakening associated with vigorous crying. Uh, this is a very uh, worrisome epilepsy type. It's one reason if you suspect your child has infantile spasms, seek medical attention uh, right away as there can be permanent brain damage, developmental regression. It's a very severe a sort of epilepsy that when I have a child come into my office and I suspect this is right to the hospital for a quick um, EEG. And the other interesting thing about infantile spasms is we don't use traditional uh, seizure medications. We'll treat these children uh, with steroid treatments. An early childhood sort of epilepsy is absence epilepsy. I discussed that um, and during the staring spell seizure part of the pre presentation. Uh, in later childhood, usual onset somewhere between 3 and 13 years old is benign epilepsy of childhood with central temporal spikes, also known as benign Rolandic epilepsy. Rolandic because it comes from the Rolandic uh, portion of, of the brain, which is in the central temporal area. This is a benign epilepsy syndrome, as the name implies. The seizures usually occur at night, with 70% of seizures occurring um, during nighttime sleep. A typical sort of seizure for a child with benign Rolandic epilepsy is awakening from sleep with some sort of unusual uh, face tingling, maybe tongue tingling, then face twitching, maybe arm twitching with altered consciousness. 
uh, or possibly retained consciousness, but usually altered uh, consciousness, not quite being themselves. It's a focal sort of seizure coming from the central temporal region, so only involves a part of the brain uh, rather than the whole brain. The seizures tend to be longer. Remember I said most complex partial seizures, somewhere between one and three minutes. Uh, the seizures associated with benign Rolandic epilepsy tend to be longer, can be as long as an hour long. Benign Rolandic epilepsy tends to run in family. There's a 50% chance that there'll be a relative that has benign Rolandic epilepsy. And where some of the controversy arises with benign Rolandic epilepsy is how much testing and treatment to do. We know it's benign, it usually it comes on somewhere between 3 and 13 years old, and tends to lessen around puberty time, and, and almost always goes away by, by adulthood. So the question of whether or not not to treat um, um, isn't always clear. I find most of my families, by around the third or fourth uh, seizure associated with benign Rolandic epilepsy, most families are wanting treatment just because they don't want to see their child have these prolonged seizures. And it's all about risk versus benefits of medication, uh, risks and side effects versus the benefits of preventing seizures. So some families might say, you know, I'm afraid to send them to any sort of camp or sleepover. I'm worried that they're going to be swimming and have a seizure or, or, or it's a very avid horseback rider. I'm worried she's going to um, fall off a, a horse when she has one of her seizures and really hurt herself. And so that might push the risk benefit of, of using medication more over to the benefit of using the, the medication when you're worried about having a seizure at an inopportune time. Now, absence seizures, if you remember, I said had a relatively benign sort of course, but there is one epilepsy syndrome that tends to come on in adolescence, which can be associated with absence seizures, and that's called juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. A typical sort of story for juvenile myoclonic epilepsy is children who have unusual twitching movements or jerks in the morning time. Sometimes what will happen is I'll get a call from the emergency department or have a child show up in my office after having a fall to the ground shake all over seizure. And I'll question the family and I'll say, is there any sort of unusual movements or things that happen in the morning? And they might say something like, you know, not to mention it, uh, she does uh, um, drop her orange juice or, 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 or the, the hairbrush when she's doing her hair or, 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 or spill things or have unusual jerks in, in the morning time uh, that started maybe six months ago. And we didn't make much of it. We thought it was some sort of tick or, or something. And now she's had this fall to the ground, shake all over sort of, sort of seizure. Juvenile myoclonic epilepsy has these jerking sort of movements, usually limited to the morning time. It's a very common idiopathic uh, epilepsy uh, syndrome that I think is under-recognized by pediatricians and even by some neurologists. Uh, it accounts for 15% of the seizures in adolescent children, so a pretty common ep epilepsy type. It does tend to run in families, and the seizures are worsened by things like sleep deprivation and physical or emotional stress. The good and bad part of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy is that it's pretty easy to treat. We can use some of the newer uh, seizure medications with a lot of side effects, and it's usually easy to control seizures for people with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Um, the bad part of it is that it's one of the epilepsy syndromes that tends to stick around for a while, well on into adulthood. I may try, after a couple of years of being seizure-free on medication, to wean off of the medication, but this is one of the epilepsy syndromes where the seizures tend to persist for many years, although it is relatively easy to treat.